Those of us who want to see the human exploration of the moon and Mars have a serious problem now. Uh, no government in the world is, is providing budgetary funds for human exploration. There is very little public support. And if you don't have public support, the government isn't going to pay for it. At today's panel, we're going to discuss what can be done under these conditions so that uh, eventually we do turn back and we'll explore the moon and Mars. Chair chairing our session today will be Larry Roberts. Thank you, David. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for uh, coming out at this hour. Uh, we do have a rather distinguished group of uh, speakers on our panel this morning. Uh, I think the best thing to do will be having uh, presentations uh, first, uh, and then we'll have a question and answer period. At some point, uh, we'll have a 10 minute break if time permits. Uh, I guess the best thing to do is to uh, <coughs> the foundation, as David mentioned. Um, NASA budgets have been uh, stagnant or declining in real terms for the past few years, and there's no real expectation of a dramatic increase in the near <coughs> future given budgetary realities. Uh, the question then becomes how to uh, keep exploration going over that period, or in fact, in fact possibly thriving, in the face of such uh, potentially declining uh, government spending. Uh, our first speaker today um, will be uh, Dr. Lewis Friedman, uh, Executive Director of the Planetary Society. I think the remainder of his uh, resume would take the rest of the session for me to uh, recount. Uh, so I think without further delay, I'd like to introduce him. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, to Again at the, uh, for, for me to speak again at the uh, NISEC conference uh, and the NSS annual convention. We've done this before, and so uh, it's good, I think, to, uh, to keep in touch. Um, because as you'll hear, I'm going to disagree, actually, already uh, with the introduction. Not your fault, you got my name right. Uh, but I don't think we're doing badly on the uh, road to uh, exploration of Mars. I think a lot's going on. A lot of government commitment uh, moving forward, and I'm going to take a somewhat uh, different view as you'll hear in the talk as to the notion that it's also bad we have to get out there and raise some other kinds of uh, issues or do it differently. Uh, of course, we always want more, we always want to go faster. I don't disagree with any of that. We're, we're great advocates for doing more and doing it faster, but I don't think we're doing that badly, and that's, that's what I want to think go. Uh, Focus on perhaps then if we uh, understand we're combining the morning sessions into a single uh, panel discussion and Q and A. If we do that, we can get into uh, uh, discussing whether we look at the glass of water half full or half empty. Um, I've been recently describing a, a great space race, uh, a debate uh, in the sense of uh, in which I think we're engaged this, this race the outcome of which would determine the very future of civilization of our way of life and the survival of our species, and that we must win in order to, to improve the superiority of our way of life. And this was the kind of talk that went on with the Cold War, and it certainly sounds anachronistic, uh, <coughs> at the time when we raced the Russians to the moon, which we're certainly not doing now. I hope it is an anachronism in that sense. It's a different race that I'm describing now. It's the race of humans versus robots. And while it's both tongue-in-cheek, I think it conveys the point which I believe we're at in contemplating human exploration off the Earth. I recall Laura Wilkening, uh, who was on the board of directors of the Planetary Society, saying at a, a, a society lecture in the early 1980s, it's not a question of whether we will explore Mars. It's only a question of what language the explorers will speak. She was referring to English, Russian, Japanese, Chinese, French as possible languages. I will add one language into this discussion and think about it, and that's the languages, language of ones and zeros. <coughs> Astronauts and cosmonauts 
capture the public imagination and, the, and support because they are seen as our emissaries. They're emissaries, our human emissaries of the future to achievements that take us further, faster, and higher. They are literally carry us over the horizon. People identify them, identify with them in a way that they do not yet identify with any other aspect of space exploration or of technological development. It is because they represent our human interests that, uh, and some would say even our innate character, that uh, we, uh, we identify so with them and, and with knowledge and as we seek our destiny and, and our understanding of our role in the universe. <coughs> human capability is reaching the point where we now have the ability to explore new worlds, and we're doing that. Interest is growing, and, in among, and one particular example of that, of course, is the progress we've made on the development of the International Space Station um, and the long flights in Earth orbit, and the progress being made for the exploration of Mars. There's a half dozen landers going to be on Mars next year, the missions that are being launched this year. That's very exciting. We've been to Mars for 20 years, and now we <laughs> set the flotilla spacecraft are being launched. This year, there are uh, three launches and six landers on Mars. It all goes well next year. And then, the very next opportunity, three more missions to Mars. It's a rather exciting time. We're beginning to co uh, cope with the rigors of long duration human space flight. And finally, again, after a nearly 20 year hiatus, we have uh, Americans flying in orbit setting new endurance records. And uh, we have progress being made next year should see the launch of the first space station hardware. <coughs> so we're making progress on both in both sides of the race. That's why I say this race is going on, the human side and the robotic side. Our robotic technology may be even developing faster than our human capability for exploring other worlds. The whole connection of miniaturizations of systems and information processing, the to telerobotics and to virtual reality, the data processing that goes on may obviate the need for a human emissary or a human presence on another world. And we may, uh, we may find that we're <coughs> satisfied with telerobotic exploration of Mars. I'm not sure. Imagine a thousand micro-rovers on Mars in a thousand different places, all out there exploring, perhaps with 50 or 100 balloons taking all the remote sensing data at centimeter type resolution. Uh, and all of this data coming back through a Mars ComSat fleet and communication orbit around Mars being brought into your computers as you build up a virtual world, a virtual world from all of the data from all of these machines. Now human exploration of Mars can be carried out by every one of you sitting in your home or your schools on, a, on the capable machines of the year 2005. <coughs> a lot earlier than most people thinking about human exploration. Will that satisfy us? Will we say, great, we're all doing it here at home, we don't need to send our human emissaries? I'm not sure. I can't imagine where the robotic technology will be in the year 2196, or even in the year 2096. But it sure is evolving fast. And I think it is, this is the aspect of the race that, I, that I'm so intrigued by because I think we are going to get this new knowledge from these robotic explorations in ways we haven't imagined, and it is going to cause a profound effect on us. I think that uh, we will, the outcome of that race will determine whether or not we are high bound on Earth, or whether or not and or we are going to become a multi-planet species. Will exploration be carried out by humans settling on Mars, or will it be an occasional visit? <coughs> will we be a multi-planet species, or will Mars turn out to be like the Antarctic, an occasional scientific expedition slowly being replaced by more and more robotic technology? Will, will exploration of the future be carried on by couch potatoes sitting at home with 3D screens and viewers and goggles and large wall projections and holographic uh, uh, images uh, floating down, perhaps? And this is the, the outcome of which I guess I think is uh, quite exciting to be part of both technologies, both the robotic technology that is doing these things and the human technology which has, as 
they said, are astronauts and cosmonauts in, in orbit. It's quite exciting to, uh, to take part in this kind of transition, if you will. We've done nothing for 20 years. We went to Mars in the 1970s. We haven't been back. We went to the moon in the early 1970s. We haven't been back. We had Americans flying in a space station in the 1970s, and then we stopped the whole development of human spaceflight. A lot <laughs> happened, and we could probably have a different panel session of reasons for all of this, but the point is it's very different now, and it's not a time to be bad. We launched a near-Earth asteroid rendezvous mission this year. We're launching three missions to Mars. Next year, there are two missions to the moon and one to a very large mission to Saturn and its moon Titan. Uh, all of these are being participated on, not just, the, these are not just U.S. missions, but the United States, Japan, European countries, and Russia are all involved in these. In 1998, we have another mission to a comet and asteroid being launched by NASA. We have a, uh, three more Mars missions, two by the United States, one by Japan. We have a vice presidential uh, Russian premier commitment to a program called Mars Together, which launches every two years, two spacecraft to Mars at least, and a statement by the NASA administrator that he wanted that he now is beginning work on the Mars sample return, something that we talked about in the uh, 1970s as the goal of Mars export, the near, near term goal of Mars exploration. But now finally we're actually beginning to work on the mission, and that's, and that's a cause I think we're going to So we're going to comets, asteroids, outer planets, we're going to the uh, to Mars. Um, and, of course, we're making a lot of progress in our understanding of the universe. The Hubble Space Telescope has produced some remarkable results. We're just seeing deeper into the universe. We're beginning to find planets, not just in, uh, we're finally beginning to get into comparative solar systemology. That is, we're seeing planets around other stars. We're going <laughs> to we anticipate a discovery rate of, I think, of other planets um, probably uh, one a month in the next few years. Uh, and isn't that going to be exciting? Because each one of them is going to develop a whole new theory about, um, or help add to our theory of planetary understanding of what it takes to make a planet habitable, what it means for a planet to be habitable, what are the conditions for life, how that evolves. All of this will be, be learned. We're making more progress now without this high level government program that says we're going anywhere. In like to sign proclamations about than we were when uh, President Bush proposed the Space Exploration Initiative a few years ago. And so that's why I'm, I'm saying that we need to emphasize this kind of progress and not focus on the fact of getting these broad pronouncements which then fail politically and actually set us back because we don't do missions during that time. Missions is where it's at, and I think we are making, uh, in this kind of sense, uh, about as well as we can expect, given sort of the national political perspective on finances and budgets, and cutting federal spending, and cutting uh, participation in, in uh, government programs instead of increasing them. The fact that we're doing all of these missions is a sign of, I think, hope, hope for the United States, hope for Russia, hope for the world, as we uh, uh, see this increase in missions. Well, we have mentioned uh, a number of these missions. Now it's a question of where is it all leading? And that, I don't think we really do have all the answers there. We should explore the moon first, but we have. We've had a dozen astronauts go to the moon. We've had uh, six human missions. We've had, uh, I think I once counted them up, some uh, over 40 robotic spacecraft. We know a lot about the moon. Lunar exploration was not stopped because uh, of, of any other reason except the fact that we had done that first phase. It was time to get on and, and do other things. There was not a lot to do there other than scientific data. Of course, as soon as we sent a scientist, we stopped all the missions. The first scientist got there, and that was the last person uh, uh, to, uh, to uh, go to the lunar surface. The, uh, what next? Well, I think that that's, has been the cause for a lot of discussion, and I'm going to tell this group about all the various conferences and ideas on lunar, uh, on lunar activities and what should happen next. I think we'll hear from another panelist here in a few minutes about ideas from the moon. Basically, there is a lot scientifically to do on the moon. There's 
probably not a lot for humans to do there. Almost anything that anyone can think of that I've ever heard of is good suggestions for lunar activity, whether they be amusement park rides or serious mining of uh, materials or bases for uh, looking out into the universe and astronomical things. All of these things basically will be done, I think, by robots. Not, they're not a place to, not an activity that's going to keep humans busy on the moon. It could be done cheaper, faster, more reliable, better uh, by, uh, by uh, telerobotics on the moon. The, other, the good news about that is it's an exciting place to do telerobotics. It's not very far away compared to having to do telerobotics a couple of hundred bits per second from a, from a distant planet. At the moon, you could do telerobotics almost like you could do joystick driving on the Earth, and it would be a very exciting aspect to build a telescope on the moon through uh, uh, telerobotics, perhaps occasionally with a human intended visit to, to fix things, and depending on how that technology emerges. So I can't see much human activity going on in the future, sustained in, in any way, but I can see an exciting future of telerobotics there if any of these applications that people are working out, which don't really fit under the category of inspiration, but really fit on the, under the general word of what I, applications or development. And that might indeed, uh, if any of that works out, uh, we might see some activity in that. There are two lunar missions going up next year. They're small science missions, um, one by Japan, one by the United States. Japan has also uh, promised another orbiter, a somewhat bigger orbiter, in, uh, 19, in uh, 2002, I believe. Uh, and we could expect, I think, there's a, a European lunar initiative that uh, uh, may or may not uh, work out. Uh, I think it would be unlikely to assume that the dirt of lunar missions will continue to work and that we should see some going back to the moon. But what else? Is that it? Or they mentioned the, the great priority of Mars exploration that's been put out. Uh, and indeed, uh, the United States is committed to the Surveyor Program, which launches two spacecraft at every opportunity, a lander and an orbiter. Russia has uh, reasserted their Mars priority many times, and if they can only, uh, if the election's next week and the stability of the country holds together, we could assume that the uh, Mars 96 will get launched this year, and if that happens, we'll probably see some emphasis on the Mars 2001 opportunity, and the chances for Mars together will increase greatly. Of course, Russia is a big question, one doesn't, can't, can't be sanguine about the predictions. Uh, Europe had a plan, this is the only bad news I can bring into this talk here. We did have a plan for an inter-MarsNet mission in 2003, in which they were going to send several landers and an Ariane launch uh, to Mars. Unfortunately, they have now, for budget reasons, delayed that plan and say that it will be 2007 before they could participate. Efforts are now going on between the United States and European countries to perhaps get them to participate in uh, our 2005 sample return plan. Japan has a Mars mission going on this year, I'm sorry, 1998, uh, and one would uh, <coughs> think that that would be followed up. They have a commitment to planetary exploration, although they do not have other Mars plans beyond uh, now on the books. Uh, their next mission after the Mars mission is to be, and I'll return to this subject in a few minutes, a, a near-Earth asteroid sample return. Uh, I mentioned the progress that's being made in the human spaceflight program, uh, and I think as soon as, uh, if, if we are lucky, we can just anticipate that 1997, at the end of 1997, the first space station hardware will be up there. We'll have more Americans in orbit on the Mir. The Mars missions will have landed, and the covers of Time magazine and various other news magazines uh, around the world will be saying, where are we going? Where next? The, the uh, lunar uh, case I've spoken about, Mars is obvious. Every report that's ever been uh, issued by, uh, by NASA or any other agency on where the uh, space, space programs are headed talks about the human Mars goal. Uh, I actually, uh, if it was up to me, I think the major question in Mars, of course, is the question of whether we'll settle there or whether it too will just be bases that we occasionally visit and they 
alluded to that earlier. If it was up to me, I would take the Zubrin approach of Mars Direct. I, mean, I love it. It's, we want to get there fast. It's certainly uh, the ideas of, uh, that uh, he introduced about rendezvous on the surface instead of rendezvous in orbit, as we, uh, as we had uh, done uh, years ago uh, with the uh, lunar mission, are, I think, a great asset. Uh, they really have changed the paradigm about Mars exploration the idea of living off the land or making resource utilization there probably will be the way we carry out uh, Mars human exploration. The, uh, so the ex exciting prospects of doing that and the commitment of now even the Mars Surveyor Project at NASA and JPL to begin experiments on <coughs> situ resource development on sample return leading to the questions of uh, human exploration of Mars is, uh, is very good. To my mind, we're making progress on Alpha, the International Space Station. I would call the Mars Sample Return 2005 Beta, and then begin to debate what is going to be Gamma, because that should get us to uh, put the humans on the surface of Mars early in the next century. Uh, I'm not sure it'll be Mars Direct. It's not up to me. I said I was enthusiastic about it. There are a lot of other competing ideas. Uh, one of the major problems that has to be solved, and none of the ideas have really solved it yet, is launch vehicles. It's been the, uh, the standard problem that we always discuss about when we get into the and Mars exploration. The NASA administrator has recognized this. He's put a great push on the development of the X vehicles, saying that we have to get launch vehicle technology uh, in the United States to be cheaper. The X vehicle may turn out to uh, lead that way. I don't know. I have some skepticism, but I'm always hopeful. Nobody has ever yet made a case to me about how that's going to help uh, send humans to Mars or how that's going to help uh, getting the heavy lift launch capability for um, future planetary missions. But at least it's progress on the technology front, uh, and we clearly need to have some kind of breakthrough in the uh, launch vehicle development. Uh, there's a lot of interesting discoveries being made by other spacecraft actually up there now. I mentioned the Hubble and the searching for the distant uh, uh, realms of the universe, the planets around other stars. Galileo has uh, already brought us a set of interesting results about Jupiter and is about to begin commenced a long-awaited satellite tour in which he was bound to see enormously interesting things on Ganymede and on Jupiter, Europa, uh, and uh, Callisto, and ultimately on Io. Um, Cassini is launching that you know, probe into the surface of Titan, or the splashdown of Titan, depending on what the Titan surface really is. Perhaps the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, the search for extrasolar planets uh, will reveal something. Uh, that's right, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence is going on as a non-government activity. And uh, so these are and, and all competing ideas that Mars is the obvious next place for a major space goal. But it's hard to imagine Galileo or Cassini or the search for extrasolar planets, or a SETI leading to a human space-like goal. One possible other diversion is the growing fascination with near-Earth objects. The near-Earth asteroid rendezvous has been launched. It will get uh, uh, to uh, its target in a few years. It will bring back some interesting results. The Japanese, as I mentioned, are developing a mission from Nereus, the closest near-Earth asteroid. They will bring back a sample of that uh, to, uh, uh, to Earth in the uh, early uh, decade, first decade of the uh, next century. Uh, we are gaining understanding of the NEOs at an enormously uh, increasing rate, both from Earth observation programs and these space probes. Uh, any of you have ever seen the Steve Ostro, Eric the Young computer animations of uh, orbits around uh, near Earth objects can immediately project how exciting it's going to be to imagine spacecraft with humans up there jumping around performing new kinds of athletic feats, uh, maybe going into orbit themselves around asteroids in a free-flying way, um, finding out uh, bits and pieces in a scientific sense about a whole range of different objects with different compositions and different origins, uh, objects that we know have profoundly influenced the uh, evolution of the terrestrial planets and the evolution of our own planet and the evolution of life itself. 
objects that we know will uh, influence it in the future. This is a, a, a possible diversion for a space goal activity from sending humans to Mars. I'm not sure if it's a human target or not. I'm not sure that we won't be satisfied by robotic exploration. Uh, I'll wait for the results of NEAR and uses C and uh, see what the public fascination is with this. But I think it is, uh, even if it is true, it's certainly something quite exciting to, uh, to uh, look forward to. So NASA, the Russian Space Agency, European Space Agency, Japan, are, are all have programs underway for Mars exploration and for other, for near-Earth object exploration, for outer planet investigations. Hubble and Galileo are bringing results. NEAR is on the way. Pathfinder and Surveyor, Mars 96 will be on the way later this year. Prospector and Lunar A, Cassini will be launched next year. Surveyor, 98, Mars Together, Planet B, New Millennium. The Mars Cod development continues. We'll see a plethora of Mars rovers in the next few years. It's not that bad a time. What we need to do, of course, and not pretend that the budgets are certainly not going up there, they're going down. All of this is in danger. It's a very fragile program. I could give it an equally long and less interesting, I don't know how interesting this was, but I'm sure you that the political talk of it less interesting on the problems in the space program as well. But I don't think that uh, uh, it's only a glass that's half empty. It is a glass that uh, is half full. I feel compelled, uh, that's <coughs> the end of uh, my uh, prepared remarks, I feel compelled to uh, refer to an article in yesterday's uh, New York Times, the uh, cover of the magazine says Red Scare. I thought that might apply to the Red Planet, and it does to me, but it's actually not. That's an article about another Red Scare, and actually one more serious, which is what's going to happen in the upcoming Russian elections. Uh, but another Red Scare was discussed by John Tierney, uh, in which he, uh, those of you who haven't seen it, uh, the title of which is How to Get to Mars, and it shows a picture of a spacecraft with Pepsi Cola and lots of other commercial logos on the board. And the suggestion is that um, the government program is doing badly. Again, with the hypothesis that I don't accept. And therefore, we need to, uh, to uh, look to these uh, what I will refer to both contentiously and also and provocatively as gimmicks in space to uh, continue uh, to, uh, to uh, make progress in this area. Uh, a lot of the article is obviously influenced by your president, uh, Bob Zubrin, who's president of the National Assembly. He's got a title up there of the executive, head of the executive board. Um, and uh, Bob and I have discussed this, uh, and uh, uh, so I suspect uh, he certainly has influenced uh, John Tierney, who himself is not a space writer from a literary uh, person, might be the reason that he was taken in more by this notion of uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, commercialization and, uh, and the Pepsi-Cola science uh, taking us to Mars. I just warn a couple of things. We went through this with Halley's Comet. The U.S. government and Reagan administration killed the idea of a U.S. Halley's Comet mission because they were taken up with the idea of some people who sold them that we could have a private Halley's Comet mission. You know what happened to that. Then there was a lot of talk, and refer to you and broke you a little bit about private lunar missions. And of course, when I got around to finally getting another lunar mission approved, it had to be traditional NASA in the orbiter that, that is going, and the Japanese we have a government program going to the moon. And well, I certainly have nothing against the private efforts. I'm skeptical that, that they're going to prove uh, sound for the commercial investor, and they're certainly not going to prove, uh, prove sound for those people who are trying to invest in new knowledge, new discoveries, and the idea of exploring and settling uh, other worlds. As we had in the Earth's exploration, the commercial ideas will have to wait for some form of either sponsored or benign government uh, research to find out the chart, to chart the path to the planets. Putting our eggs in this basket killed us in lunar exploration for 20 years. It killed us in the Halley Comet expeditions. I'm fearful to some extent. I'd, I'd like to see public interest. I'd like to get cover stories or at least major stories in the New York Times Magazine about going to Mars. <laughs> probably the net effect is good. 
But before we get too excited about them, let's realize that they could also be counterproductive. They could be excuses to reduce the government programs of exploration, as they were in the 70s and 80s, and as we're just recovering from right now. It's uh, uh, a long time for Mars, at least, and I think the moon as well, certainly the nearby objects, are going to be a sound commercial investment. But more, you make more money in your checking account. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Uh, it's certainly reassuring uh, to know that uh, the government programs possibilities aren't just rolling over and playing dead, uh, that uh, new and uh, vibrant missions are planned and are expected to be executed. Uh, I suspect, however, we're going to be hearing a little bit of rebuttal time from our next speaker, uh, uh, Ms. Victoria Beckner. Uh, she's the Director of External Affairs for LunaCorp, uh, a company formed uh, in 1989 uh, to pr pursue private space exploration. Uh, before uh, coming to LunaCorp, uh, Victoria worked as a contractor for NASA's Microgravity, uh, to Microgravity Science Applications Division. Uh, and uh, prior to that uh, career in the space industry, she uh, worked as a political consultant and legislative aide. Uh, Victoria? I feel strange standing up here in the microphone like we should break out into song or something. Um, my name is Victoria Beckner. I'm with uh, LunaCorp. And uh, I'd love to take up the challenge that Lou Friedman just raised here about uh, the power of the moon and the ability to do a private uh, mission, uh, the viability of that. Um, let me just start by saying LunaCorp is planning a private mission to the moon in 1999. We're working with Carnegie Mellon University's Robotic Institute. And the idea is to put two robotic vehicles on the moon and using telepresence technology, bring back live video uh, and other types of data, and let you, the public, actually conduct the exploration remotely by being able to drive the rovers live and to be completely immersed in all of the experience uh, of what those rovers are doing on the lunar surface. That's just a little bit of a taster because what I wanted to say is that I think many of you probably would like to go to the moon yourselves. Can, can I just see a hands of who would like to physically go? Figures. Uh, now, I, I don't know whether there will ever be a government program to take humans back to the Earth. I think that Lou is right in saying that we've done a series of lunar missions. Uh, we've, uh, we've put a number of astronauts on the surface, but one thing that we didn't do is we didn't get the public directly involved in the lunar missions. And one of the things that the moon offers because of its distance is that there's only a three to five second communications delay. So telepresence is something that is completely viable on the moon, whereas if you start talking about further distances such as Mars and and, and further on out, telepresence and direct exploration remotely by the public becomes less viable. What I'd like to say is All right. Lunacorp was formed in 1989 to uh, pretty much see if they could create uh, commercial markets for space exploration projects. <laughs> Uh, there was the feeling that government uh, budgets were shrinking uh, and that we really needed to have some alternative means of uh, uh, having space missions and probably, oops, make it a little easier. Uh, also, just again, the idea of getting the public involved and getting them involved directly. And one of the things about commercial markets is is that it does involve people. It does end up bringing in other companies, other kinds of promotions, and other ways in which people can be involved. Uh, we publish two CD-ROMs on space. This is the way we sort of support ourselves on a day-to-day -day level. Return to the Moon and Mission Planet Earth are two CD-ROMs we authored and uh, market. That is our sort of basic income besides uh, the money that the founders have put into LunaCorp. Uh, and in 1993, we joined up with Dr. Red Whitaker. Uh, he is the uh, uh, 
chief scientist of the Robotic Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. And uh, he and his team at Carnegie Mellon are currently designing the two teleoperated rovers that we plan to launch in 1999. I'll give you just a little bit more detail about Carnegie Mellon. Uh, Red Whitaker is pretty much NASA's chosen researcher for lunar rovers. JBL sort of has all the rest of the universe. Uh, he has, uh, these are examples of, this here is, you all may be familiar, this is Dante II, was the rover that descended down to the Mount Spur active volcano in Alaska. Uh, it uh, went down to the bottom of the volcano, came back up, and at the very end, tipped over, they had to rescue it. But it pretty much conducted that whole mission autonomously. In other words, using artificial intelligence programming, it picked its own safe path uh, into the volcano and back up. What I just want to say here is that Red Whitaker and his team at Carnegie Mellon are probably, this is probably the leading institute for autonomous nav navigation for mobile robots. And the reason why that's important for us is although we're going to have the public driving these rovers live, in case somebody's driving and wants to go over a cliff, Robots actually have to be smart enough to uh, safeguard uh, against that, and they need to be able to sort of stop and say, no, nope, we've got a cliff on the other side, we're not going that way. You need to have the robots be intelligent in case of mischief or mistake by the amateur drivers. Uh, there's also the Robotics Engineering Consortium that was recently formed, and they have, they're currently building a large uh, lunar uh, landscape uh, for testing of the lunar rover. I was just going to say, this is an example also of two other autonomous vehicles. One is a uh, harvester that harvested some alfalfa on its own and a, uh, uh, a uh, military vehicle that drove autonomously, that's without any guidance, <laughs> across the country. We didn't want to be on the highway while that one was going. But, uh, <laughs> some mission overview. Um, Uh, our plan is to land again two rovers on the lunar surface in 1999 for two years of exploration. Uh, we plan, it's, it's almost entirely based on the idea of public participation and that's how we're marketing it to the commercial sector. Uh, the primary uh, customer for the mission is a theme park or some kind of space center where people would come and drive the rovers live there. That's where mission control would be located. That's where other people who weren't driving the rovers could still go into a room, sit on a motion platform, be surrounded by a 360 degree view of the lunar terrain while, while the uh, rovers are crossing the sea of tranquility. Uh, maybe even see, hear, and smell uh, the environment because uh, a lot of that data can be brought back and translated in such a way that people could be immersed in the experience. Um, theme Park is the main customer. There are four other customer categories that we're marketing to. One are the TV networks for who would purchase the primary media rights because this is not a NASA mission. You can actually have networks pay for that right. Uh, the other large group are corporate sponsors. We're looking to market. We have been actively marketing to about seven or eight uh, corporate sponsors, uh, including computer companies, um, uh, auto industry, online services, uh, even clothing and tennis shoe companies. We've been in to talk to the presidents of a number of the major corporations, and there's actually a great deal of interest in this. The model is sort of the Olympics model. You can get media rights, you can design promotions, and you get logo use if you're a corporate sponsor. Uh, the last category, well, there's internet and multimedia. I sort of lumped that in with the other corporate sponsors. Um, that's a, you can have an online service offer the live lunar data and perhaps let people drive the rovers on the moon over the internet. And the last uh, category is uh, science and industry. We would like to have some science on this mission. We are planning to include some science payloads. Basically what we're offering NASA or any of the other international space agencies or private universities is a very reasonable price for uh, either mass or time of the rover, uh, 
so that they can conduct some science research, but we're not looking for that to be the primary amount, uh, the you know, primary chunk of funding for the mission. This here is our route. Uh, at the very bottom there, uh, we plan to land near the Apollo 11 site, um, move up through the visit the rain trade crash and surveyor five, and then even though this is a, looks like a straight line, uh, we'll be exploring across the Sea of Tranquility. A lot of it depends on where the drivers want to go because the public is leading this exploration. And uh, up at the, the almost the second to last point is the Apollo 17 site, and then go off and look for the Limicod 2 rover. Uh, we expect, expect this again to be uh, about two years of exploration, uh, cruising around, and there'll be many uh, deep, uh, changes in route if scientists want to take a look at something or people want to go and take a look at something. At this point, you're wondering, how much is this going to cost for us to do this? Uh, we think that we can pretty much do this for about $200 million. Uh, that is because we have gotten a price uh, originally from Lovachkin for a Russian proton flight for $65 million. Um, we've also had uh, other organizations uh, say that they can match that price. I'll go into more detail on that later. That the launch and lander and then the rover development that Carnegie Mellon University is doing are the two largest chunks of this mission. And uh, by the way, the rover development includes contingency in case we, well, let me back up for a second. The launch, that, that launch cost includes a guaranteed reflight and insurance on the third flight. So that if we have problems getting to the surface the first time, we have problems getting there the second time, uh, we've, got some, we've got money built into this budget for that. Same thing for the development of two more rovers in case we don't get there safely. Um, the rest are ground stations, uh, management, um, uh, uh, excuse me, launch insurance is a separate section here. Contingency becomes profit in the end. Um, uh, in the, unless we run into additional problems that our, con that our other uh, contingency funds built into the launch and rover development don't cover. Um, so it's about $200 million mission. And then here is how we expect to raise the money and how much each of the uh, oops, commercial customers we expect to give. All right. Um, the largest single customer is the theme park or the space park. Uh, that's at seven, $60 million. Uh, we expect about $70 million from the seven or eight corporate sponsors altogether. Uh, about $45 million from total from all the science payloads that we're carrying. Another $45 million from the networks. And then the rest is in multimedia, books, toys, etc. Where did we get these numbers? We got these numbers from a number of different meetings with potential customers who are interested in both the United States and outside of the United States, uh, and um, basing it on other things like, like the Olympics as a model that we're using for the corporate sponsors. But just to give you a ballpark, ballpark uh, here, 60 million for the theme park. Um, Disney spent 340 million on the Indiana Jones ride. This is a drop in the bucket for somebody like Disney. Uh, so we're not even getting a blink of an eye from the theme parks that we've been marketing this to. All right, I just want to say a couple more points about the theme park experience. <coughs> okay. We had the artist Mark, Mark Maxwell do a whole series of theme park paintings. I'm, not going to go in and show you all of them, but these are sort of motion platform pods that could hold eight to ten people. So there's live exploration going on. You all want to be a part of it. You can come to the theme park, and if you want to drive, you first go through a series of simulators. You maybe drive rovers on a simulated uh, lunar train, and you train, and your scores get recorded with a smart card, and people with the best scores every three to five minutes get pulled up to actually drive the rovers live. If you're someone who doesn't want to drive it, don't care, you're part of the blue hair crowd, or you're, you, 
you don't really need to, to actually be controlling the rovers. Uh, you can get into these pods. There will be you know, uh, many of them. It can be arranged a little differently than this. Um, and you'll be able to feel everything that the rover is feeling, be surrounded by 360 degree view of the lunar terrain. And uh, we had one theme park say, well, let's, let's translate what the smell is like. Let's, let's get temperature changes in there. Uh, let's translate some of the vibrations into sound so that people experience everything that the rovers are experiencing on the moon. So it's just like you're there, checking your senses, except you're still on Earth. Um, the theme park will also have, that will be where mission control will be, where the scientists will be working, where there will be backup systems for the rovers, there will be uh, educational exhibits, uh, and a number of other attractions built around this. We've been marketing this both as a large attraction within, uh, within an existing theme park, and we have um, some interest from some startup theme parks that would like to build an actual space park around this exhibit. So it can go either way for the theme park customer. As I mentioned, the other commercial customers, uh, TV networks uh, have, uh, you can also have a major network purchase the primary media rights, i.e. NBC is the place where you get the live uh, views of the moon and programs around that. There are other things, there are big, big event telecasts that might be distributed to all the networks, like when we visit the Apollo 17 site, we visit the Apollo 11 site, launch and landing. Um, there are also, uh, with one of the networks we were speaking with, interest in building a whole series of programs about the moon, about trying to do it privately, uh, and then sort of the excitement of returning for the first time in over a quarter of a century. So there's a lot of programming possibilities here for the networks. Um, corporate sponsors, uh, an example of, um, we have pitched to a, uh, um, a, a clothing company. I wish I could talk a little bit about the companies that we've actually been marketing to. I, I can't um, because there's potentially media here. I, I might be able to talk a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with some people, but we have a, a clothing company that loves the idea of um, that they can sell a whole, you can sell uh, the item of clothing. I'm trying to be discreet about this and um, to say schools, and the schools that get the most purchase receipts um, can digitize their entire yearbook or messages from all the students and include that in a space-time capsule that we would take and deliver to the surface of the moon. A uh, contest for a car company has been for the first driver. Uh, who's going to be the first person to drive the rover on the moon? Well, if you all go out and uh, test drive a Toyota or a Ford or whatever, you get entered into that contest. Uh, so these are examples of the promotions. And again, they also get media rights. They also get logo rights. They get the traditional things you would get in sponsoring any kind of event, exposure at the theme park and that kind of thing. Um, each corporate sponsor would be, uh, depending on the promotions and the rights that we negotiate, would be between eight and twelve million dollars per corporate sponsor. Um, again, on the online multimedia, that would be if you're an online. Which company or which browser is going to give you direct link to the moon? Maybe you'd be more willing to sign up with AOL rather than CompuServe if AOL is the only place that you can go. I'm just using that as an example. <laughs> I want to take a second to talk about lunar research. Um, Lou is right that uh, we have done a fair amount of science re research on the moon, but in fact, we've only touched down at a couple of spots. And if you'd only touched down at maybe 10 or 12 spots on the Earth, how well would you know the Earth? The moon contains a record of the solar system in its, in its crust. We can learn a lot about the history of the Earth and the history of the solar system by doing geological research. It's also an ideal platform to do astronomy uh, because of the lack of atmosphere and other kinds of interference. And uh, it's, we, we think that there's tremendous possibility possibilities here. There's also uh, interest from some in industry about potential of helium-3 and uh, actually 
producing and transporting oxygen. Um, what we can offer to NASA, to NASDA, to ESA, or to any individual small university is that if you want to fly an instrument, it's $1.2 million per kilogram. Now think about the NASA budget for a second. Think about if you had a small instrument, a small or x-ray spectrometer, or something that you wanted to bring to bring up. You could do that for less than $5 million. We don't present this as competition to government programs. What we're saying is, is that commercial missions, and particularly the moon, which we think can be done commercially, offers additional scientific opportunities for NASA and other researchers. And uh, again, $7,000 if you want to just have one hour of dedicated rover time, use the existing cameras and sensors, and go look at something and have exclusive right to that data. Um, $7,000, we think that small universities can do that. This is designed so that we can get lots of individuals involved and deliver some good science and do it for a price that Congress might not be willing to fund in the future for lunar missions. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, we may be a little bit more skeptical about the NASA programs and particularly the lunar programs getting to the surface. Uh, that's it about uh, science. Just want to give you basically an update on where we are on the technical side for the rovers and where we are on the marketing side, and then I'll be finished. Um, the biggest issue for the rover design is uh, surviving the lunar night. It's a thermal issue. 14 days of temperatures less than liquid nitrogen. Uh, it's very cold and it's long. <laughs> If you just go up with solar panels and a battery, you in fact have to have a battery bigger than myself to be able to reliably survive and start up again when the lunar night is over. The other problem with a 14 day lunar night is if you're in a theme park, you shut down for half a month or you show highlights, reruns, whatever. Um, it's a problem for us, the idea of an all-solar design. Um, and in fact, Carnegie Mellon, we've been researching both the solar design and also using isotope power, RTGs. And uh, basically, they came back and said, all solar, it's just not feasible. What is feasible is a solar design with a radioisotope heating unit, just a little tiny pellet of plutonium, which you know, emits a little bit of heat and you stick those by the key instruments and that's how you survive the lunar night. That's the only way we think we can do a solar mission. We are trying to do this for two years. Um, we've also been investigating using RTGs, but there's a great deal involved in the safety review and um, uh, launch approval for that. As I'm sure you all know, every, every planetary mission that launches with an RTG is protested and there's a great elaborate process for making sure that the public's not at risk for that. Um, the rovers are about 200 to 250 uh, kilograms in weight. Uh, we need about a six uh, megabit per second data rate. That's because we're bringing back high quality color, uh, better than broadcast quality video. Um, we recently, the actual power requirement has gone, has gone down with some technological developments. We have about 300 watts per rover. Uh, there will be four panospheric cameras that will give the 360 degree view uh, and two on the undercarriage so that uh, we can see any obstacles. Uh, phased array for the communication and three receiving stations around the Earth so that uh, uh, we can maintain a continuous signal. Uh, and then a lot of the other requirements of the rover can be determined by the customers as we, as we sign them up. Uh, this is a, a mission that is going to be uh, you know, arranged around who are the customers, what do they want to get back from the mission. And here's just a picture of the latest design for a solar plus RHU rover. Again, the RHU is just the radioisotope heating unit. And uh, I like the most recent design because it's got the fin here. I think that that looks pretty cool. Um, it raises up once, and then you don't have to you know, worry about deployment uh, after that. Um, 
we've gone through, Carnegie Mellon has gone through a series of designs. Um, there's been about two years of uh, rigorous design work going on with the rovers, but again, a lot of the final details are going to depend on the customers. Uh, Lunacorp's progress to date in marketing. There are two events prior to the mission that we are working on so that corporate sponsors and customers can start getting out the word and getting the public involved before the mission. Uh, the first one is a website. It's called Robots in Cyberspace. This is where you'll be able to log on to the internet and be able to drive real rovers at uh, Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. And uh, it's a little different from what you can do now on the internet. We've created special software so that you don't have to wait <coughs> An incredibly long time for the download of a single image, you'll actually be able to drive them at lightning speed um, with this proprietary software that we've developed. And we hope that this will be a sponsored site and that uh, customers that sign up will be sponsored. And, and that the other advantage of this is that we learn a little bit about how people work with the interface um, over the internet for controlling the rovers. The second here is uh, the what we call the Desert Trek. In 19, uh, next year, in the summer, Carnegie Mellon will be testing a prototype of the lunar rover uh, at a desert, either in Australia, possibly near the Mojave here. It's a two-month trek to test the technology. It'll also be a first test of people being able to drive the rovers again live uh, from some mission control station and probably from the, the internet site robots in cyberspace. Again, promotion for the corporate sponsors, testing of the technology, starting to get people involved, getting people's feedback on what the experience is like. Um, the big news for Little Corp is that in a way we have signed our first customer. I think prior to any other um, meeting in which any of us have spoken to, we've been you know, this close. Uh, the big news is, is that Mitsubishi has issued us um, our first small contract. This is to formalize the relationship. In fact, Mitsubishi is actively marketing our project to Japanese customers, and they have a number of entertainment, uh, scientific, and uh, engineering customers who are we are in negotiations with now. Um, the contract was to look at using the H2 launch vehicle. Uh, we had originally gotten a $65 million price, again, from Lavochkin for the Proton. Uh, the Japanese said uh, we would be willing to meet that price for the guaranteed reflight. Problem is, there's no lander involved here. That's a significant technical issue. But um, So we were looking at how does that affect the mission to go on the H2, and they wanted us to revisit the solar power issue of the rovers and, uh, and what's involved in uh, getting approval to launch either an RTG or RHUs on rovers. Uh, we've completed that study, that study is done, and now we are moving towards uh, uh, a series of meetings with various Japanese customers. Our president went over to Japan for a week, and I wish I could tell you who, who they are. We've got um, theme parks, TV networks, science researchers, Japanese space agency, a great deal of interest from Japan. And Japan, Japanese customers are much quicker to put their money down for this than we've found that the American customers are. However, we have a progress right now, serious discussions with uh, three auto companies, two US and one foreign, uh, for sponsorship. Um, again, I mentioned the clothing companies, and uh, we have an interest from a computer maker and an online service. Uh, so there's a lot of excitement right now. I wish I could go into more detail, but I can't at this point. And then I just want to end with uh, the fact that, um, you know, we're not talking about putting humans on the moon, but we are talking about involving people in the mission. And this has really captured the attention and excitement of the general public. Um, we've got stories uh, in uh, Advertising Age, Newsweek, Popular Science, uh, Playboy, um, uh, San Jose Mercury News, Business Week. I'm just going to show you a copy. The Business Week article actually was the one that stimulated a lot of companies from calling us. And uh, this is the Business Week article. Uh, this painting, again, is by Mark Maxwell. Um, 
And we're now getting uh, calls saying, look, we'd like to set up a meeting. We're interested in this. We want to be the company associated with the first return to the moon in, in over a quarter of a century. And uh, it's been extremely exciting. Um, that's pretty much the end of my presentation. If you have any questions later on, I'll be available. I don't have any questions. Sorry, I'd like to diverge from the program a little bit. Can you use your schedule? Uh, if there are any specific questions relating to uh, Lunafor, uh, why don't we take them now for at least a few minutes? Uh, so OK, sure. Yes. If you're going to make some money, then Lunafor is not. You know, <laughs> right. Luna Corp's not going to make a tremendous profit until at, until once we're doing the mission because we've got to make down payments on the launch. We've got to be funneling money to Carnegie Mellon University. Who right now, their design work is being funded by NASA. Um, so there are the preliminary events to encourage early payments by customers, but uh, the profit comes in what's left over at the end of the mission. And if we actually have some kind of participation in the theme park, which has been one of the possibilities, we may be an investor in a theme park. We also have companies that are interested in investing in Luna Corp, and there's been talk of a public offering. One problem with the moon is a, a sort of live environment is that it's colors are very muted and bland. One way that you might be able to overcome this without having extremely enhanced color sensitivity in the camera is to spread out the red, green, and blue channels and for infrared, visible, and near all the virus, which would give a higher color contrast damage without a nice, high signal to noise. Because if, if you can, either with that or with a little bit of processing on the signal, yeah, kind of a contrast a little bit, it would be a more live environment. Because things like the orange soil and the Apollo 17 site, where you could actually see it on TV, were extremely exceptional. Yeah. Um, I don't know if everyone heard that. Um, it, it's the idea that, you know, uh, the moon is not, doesn't have the gigantic and flashy range of colors, but that with adequate sensors and expanding the spectrum that you actually bring back, um, you can really enhance the color and imagery, and, and actually we do we do plan to do that. I mean, it'd be really cool to be able to come to the theme park and see. I and mean, what's the moon like from an infrared, <laughs> you know, or any other kind of uh, sensor? But but use that to enhance the experience. It's, I'd like to talk to you further about that. Too. It's a good idea. We have thought a little bit about that. Yes. Hi. Um, I love the idea, oh. and I'd like to participate financially. Uh, I like to, I would like to see you that this whether it's real or not. So I have a simple question. Is it a public or a private company? Are there financials that, that I can obtain anywhere if you make any reports to the SEC? All right, uh, right. Um, we do get a lot of interest from people who want, who want to invest. And we are a privately held company uh, at this point so that you actually have to have a net worth of over a million dollars to invest. Uh, and that's because they don't want widows and orphans to be investing in profit making ideas of getting robbed. So they figure if you've got that much money, you're going to be smart about your investment. Um, so that's where you have to be to invest now. We do plan to have a public offering uh, later on, actually, either during the mission or just prior to launch once we have all the customers signed. Do uh, you know, uh, do you have any idea of what, what the theme park would charge in the, the, quite the Yeah, the question is what would the theme park charge? Uh, basically, the idea is if it is an attraction in an existing theme park, you wouldn't pay, if you paid any additional money, it might be $5, but it might just be covered in the general theme park price. Um, if it's a theme park that, or a space attraction that's built sort of like Epcot Center, a smaller thing that's built around space and technology, still, uh, we've been presenting to theme parks at the price of $20, maybe $25 a ticket. We want, you know, theme parks have got to have 3,000 people per hour throughput to make their money. And, you know, you're not going to get that if the tickets are more than $20. Except in Japan, <laughs> where, where the prices of attractions are uh, astronomical. <laughs> but, yeah. How long would the uh, a driver actually have at the wheel, so to speak? Yeah, um, we have pretty much thought, again, that's, that's partly up to the theme park, but what we looked at was pretty much five minutes. What does this mean? This means that not a lot of people are going to actually get to drive. 
Um, you do have to go through sequence and training. Part of it is you've got to get used to the delay. And we don't want just the Nintendo crowd who's ready to like, you know, go all over the place driving these. I mean, safety is also an issue. Um, so uh, there will be a filtering system. Not everyone's going to want to drive, but you're right. There's not going to be, it's going to be a small percentage of the people that come to visit. And we don't think that that is a problem because of the fact that you could come and ride along with the driver and get all the experience and be, be at a place where the, the headquarters of where live exploration is happening. Um, also, the corporate promotions often will reward winners of contests or whatever will get a guaranteed time, certificates for guaranteed five minutes driving time, or maybe winning, winning a prize in which they get a full hour and a pack, you know, a package involving you know, other things, dinner with an astronaut, that kind of thing. So there will be other ways where you could get guaranteed time that would motivate you to go and test drive a Toyota or something. <laughs> so, yes? After the successful conclusion of this mission, what are Luna Corp's plans for the future part? Okay, question is what's our future plan? Um, we, we think that telepresence has a tremendous potential. Uh, we see sending robots into exotic places on Earth and designing um, uh, different kinds of attractions around that. We do plan to go back to the moon. We would like to do a series of missions. We are thinking about putting humans on the moon uh, also um, at some point. Um, so we do plan to have a series of missions. A lot of what we're doing is in the business of creating these markets, creating so software and interface uh, experiences for people to be able to remotely explore. So we've got a lot of different product products, and we do have plans for future missions. Our second lunar mission, we would like to actually have a little bit more scientific and put an array of telescopes on the moon. We're very hot for the idea of a lunar observatory. So that's... Uh, as part of our long-term plans. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Next speaker is uh, Ian Strzok. Uh, he is uh, vice president uh, of the Lunar Resources Company uh, and serves as director of publications at uh, the Art and Society International. The Art of the Society is devoted uh, to uh, developing a private venture to build a commercial uh, manned moon base. Uh, prior to joining uh, those organizations, uh, Ian was uh, an associate editor at uh, Analog Science Fiction in Fact and Asimov's uh, Science Fiction Magazine. Uh, with that, uh, welcome uh, Ian Strong. Right, right. So I'm, I'm using a bit um, less prepared. I knew the full presentation on the Artemis project on Friday. Hope you all caught that. I know you didn't. But I will give you a brief synopsis of it and try to defend my position sitting there between Victoria and Robert, which may be a bit difficult. Um, I hope you don't think me too heretical if I tell you that listening to this conference the entire weekend, I found it fascinating, but I found it in a lot of ways directed improperly. A great deal of what I've heard here is we should tell the government to spend more money on space. We should we should increase NASA's funding and increase the number of missions that NASA runs. And the Artemis project is predicated on precisely the opposite goal. To convince the government to do what we want it to do means that we have to be as powerful as the powerful interests that are convincing the government to do what we want it to do. And a lot of the time that means having a significant minority or perhaps a majority of the people. The Artemis Project, on the other hand, is private, it's commercial. We don't want the government's money, we want private individuals' money. We're looking for, considering we're, we, we're planning to set ourselves a manned commercial moon base, we expect to launch in the next seven to 10 years, and we expect that the first flight will cost us about $1.4 billion. These are the current plans. We expect that we can find on the order of 10 million interested people around the country who are willing to buy some products to help get the project going and get us to the moon. We don't expect to find 125 million people, or half the population, and we don't need to. <coughs> Excuse me. 
We also don't expect anybody to invest in spaceflight. Spaceflight, though we've been doing it for quite a while, is still very risky and not entirely safe. It's not a very safe investment. So the plan of the Artemis project is to sell the pieces of it commercially. We're hoping to interest people in spaceflight by selling things like magazines, books, toys, games, clothing, movies, video games, things that people know, that people can understand, that people can invest in. Business plans for these products are much simpler to put together, much simpler to sell to the public, and that's the way that the Artemis project is going to work. Artemis magazine, my major piece of the project, should be incorporated in the next couple of weeks and start selling stock, and the first issue should be out by the end of the year. We're not going to buy an entire moon base with magazine. We are going to raise public awareness of it, and we're going to fund a little piece of it all. We'll start publishing books approximately a year later. We have an internet store, which we're building rather rapidly, selling all, all sorts of moon memorabilia that we hope the public will take to and wish to purchase. And a piece of all the profits are funneled into our Lunar Base Development Fund, which is part of the Artemis Society, a nonprofit corporation. The Artemis Society, through this fund, will be purchasing the flight, purchasing the hardware, and getting us to the moon. I, I wish I could give you a full presentation and, and give you all the bells and whistles. I don't think that's a necessity. You know the technical aspect. Technically, it's not hard to get to the moon. We've been there, we can do it again. Technology is advanced, we can do it cheaply, quickly, easily. The whole problem is funding things. And we look at funding as not needing to go to the government, but rather needing to go to the people who are interested in funding the project. Our long-term goals, we look at the moon as a wonderful test bed for our Mars spacecraft, because when such a <coughs> gets into trouble, well, it's only four days from home. The environment is just about as harsh. But rather than flying all the way to Mars and then finding out, gosh, you know we're going to run out of food on the trip home, we hope that the Artemis Project will be able to provide that information before we take the longer step to Mars, and we hope to get to Mars a bit further down the road. Um, we have some literature hanging out in the lobby. <coughs> I'm happy to answer lots of questions about the project. I'm sorry to sound so unprepared to you, and I hope you won't take this as an example of the entire company, because in terms of business plans, we are not unprepared. Should I take questions? Or uh, no, I think we should uh, <coughs> wait for this particular case. Okay. So, Victoria was a special case. Of course she is. <laughs> Thank you. In many ways. <laughs>